All right. So we got the recording going. <clears throat> I think we can start up and we'll see. Uh, I already know that there's going to be a couple people I think that won't be hopping on tonight. So that's why we do the recordings, but hopefully we uh, can see some more people jump in here. I will <clears throat> Let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover. We're going to try to get through chapter two and three today. We'll see how that goes. Um, not making any promises, but uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for your word and we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, to your promises that you've given to us, Lord, that if we're diligent on our part, if we're studious and we seek out your truth, Lord, you've promised to change us with it, Lord, that you would transform who we are from the inside out, Lord, that you would turn us into a new creation, one that's obedient and meek and humble, one that looks like, <clears throat> Lord, your son. We pray that as we dive into your word tonight, Lord, that you would help us to find your wisdom. You would help us to find a new perspective, not not so that we can just have a, a puffed up head or have head knowledge of, of what's in your word, Lord, but that we could be turned into useful vessels, Lord, that we could be turned into servants that are hungry and eager to do your will, that are hungry and eager to, to work for your kingdom and with your message, Lord. Help us to find a, a, a heart, Lord, like yours, transform ours into one that can see people with compassion, those who are hurt and those who are longing for truth and they need a, a touch from you, Lord, help us to see people through your eyes so that we're not impulsive and we're not abrasive and we're not judgmental, Lord, like our flesh would lead us to be, but we could be patient and kind and wise, Lord, that we could be a good example of you, someone who can be an image of you, Lord, and someone who can be useful for your kingdom. Lord, edify us tonight. Help us to unlearn the things that are hindering our walk with you. Help us to let go of the things, Lord, that are leading us into deception, our pride and our ego, and Lord, bad ideas that are coming from places that are not led and, and directed by you. Help us to always stay on the path and help us to realize that as we mature spiritually, Lord, we have a responsibility to do what you've called us to do, that you'll let us be disobedient. And you'll let us walk into dis to deception and you'll let us walk into confusion, Lord, if we decide that disobedience is what we want over obedience to what you've directed us to do. Lord, quicken us to that truth. Help us to take things seriously in our walk with you because time is short and we don't have time to waste. Be with us tonight, Lord, and anoint this time together of fellowship. As we dig into your word, we pray that you would guide us and lead us to your truth. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so last... <clears throat> Last week, get some water here. So last week we did an introduction to the book of Judges and we, we, we powered through chapter one. What are a couple of the high points from last week that you guys took away from, from our study? What are some of the things that we covered? Uh, I got a couple. Sure. Um, without leadership or mentorship, like discipleship is just like non-existent and you'll really struggle, especially if you were saved. And we see that, like, with Israel, after Joshua, since he didn't continue, they didn't know who was to go up. So they went to God to basically find out who was in charge. So mm -hmm. he was like, okay, we're going to have Judah go up. So just um, a lot of that, we just see where, like, one generation was successful and then where the other failed because that successful stuff that was going on didn't continue. So those are yep. just mine. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of the, that's the foundation for the book. Um, and while, obviously, we're studying Judges, you know, if you look throughout the entirety of scripture, that's a common theme. Um, what you know, stuck with me was the cycle for sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how we get um, we get focused on it and we kind of get stuck in the weeds and we have a hard time breaking out of it. Um, we're going to look at two examples today when we get into chapter three, the first two of the section that that's that's broken down into deliverance. Um, and that's I think God gives us as many examples as he does, because no matter how mature we get, if we aren't diligent and if we don't dis, you know, discipline ourselves to the word that God's given to us, we can just as easily fall back into those and get tripped up in them. And it can be an issue for us as well, even if we're veterans, you know, quote unquote veterans when it comes to our spiritual maturity. Um, so we're going to look a little bit at that today and actually take a couple of examples to apply to that. Um, but that should be a warning to each one of us right now. We're in a little bit of a different generation. But the same concept still applies. There still needs to be discipleship, right? If we believe that we're in the end times and we're going to see the, you know, the final uh, seven years wrap up here in a little bit and see Jesus return, we're not necessarily as 
concerned or we're not in the same headspace where we need to think, what's my legacy going to be? You know, what am I doing for my children? Because we're focused on the end of the age, right? And th those things may come back up in the kingdom. You know, I believe that they will during a time of peace where we'll be able to have families and grow them and lead them into the, to the truth of the Lord. But it's going to be a little bit of a different context. But nonetheless, the principle still applies that there still needs to be discipleship, even if it's not, you know, a parent uh, child relationship, you know, in the in the nuclear sense, there's still the body of Christ where there's baby believers who need discipleship by those who are a little bit more mature. And without that, we are setting up the next generation of Christians spiritually to fail. Right. And so we're going to see that that concept hammered over and over again in Judges. And then when we look at the rest of Scripture, when we have Judges kind of in the back uh, back of, excuse me, back of our mind for context, it'll make more sense when we see the kingdom have issues with fathers and sons. When we see the same issues taking place throughout the nations when Israel's dealing with their ups and downs, when they're dealing with um, their leadership that's, you know, basically they're doing good, they're doing strong, you know, a generation or two later they're having an issue. And it, it stems from leadership that's following after and being obedient to God in more than just being obedient, but also leading you know, the disciples in the next generation to follow and love God as well. Okay, so that's really overarching theme. Uh, so let's go, let's review the intro. Uh, just real quick here, the three sections of the book of Judges. The first one can be broken down into the decline, right? The first couple of chapters where we see the spiritual and political background that is leading up to the time of the Judges in chapter one and two. So the first is <clears throat> kind of that political um, context for what's going on with the people, what they are doing, what they're not doing. And then chapter two, uh, which we'll look at today, um, that's going to break down kind of the spiritual issues. It's going to do a comparison of the two generations leading up to what was going on and give us the, you know, kind of the cliff notes, so to speak, of why Israel suffered and struggled during the time of the judges. Okay. The second section is what we would call the bulk of the book of judges, which is like you know, the tail end of chapter three up until about chapter 16. That's this, that's the section of deliverance, right? That's where we look at the concept of the cycle of sin, where we'll deal with sin, right? We'll struggle, we'll fall into sin. It will always result in slavery, whether we can see it or not. That slavery, depending on our relationship with God, will cause us to cry out. That supplication is the next one where we're crying out. Now, what we see in the judges is the attitude where they're crying out to God because of the results of their sin, not because of the sin, right? And that's two different things. As a person who has a relationship with God, when we have sin, it's going to affect us, and our perspective is going to be, God, don't let this ruin my relationship with you, right? I don't care much, as much about the pain. I'll get through that as long as I'm with you, but just don't leave me. It's that whole concept of David through the Psalms. Whatever you do, Lord, chastise me, correct me, make it hurt. Whatever I have to do to learn from it, I am sorry, but he was repentant of his sin, and that's why God loved David's heart, right? That's why he says he was a man after his own heart, was because of his attitude. We see through the judges, and we'll see this through these examples, that their primary concern was, we're dealing with the result of our sin. We don't care as much about the sin, right? So that's what we need to be careful of in our own personal walk with God is, you know, when we're stuck in a position that sucks, are we concerned more about the fact that we're in pain are we concerned more about the fact of we caused the pain, right? That's sin. Where is our attitude? What is our perspective? Do we go to God with entitlement saying, I'm going through this pain. This sucks. You got to take this away, God. Meanwhile, we're not concerned with the reason that we're going through the pain, which was disobedience or sinful behavior, right? So we need to always, always be careful because we can always fall into that entitlement. If we don't bury God's truth in our life, pride, it's easy for pride to kind of rear its ugly head and we can become entitled and think, oh, well, you know, I've been a Christian for, you know, so many years. Why would God do this to me? Or I've been obedient or he's been doing these things through my life or I've given so much to the Lord or, you know, whatever it may be. And then we we're angry with God because we're dealing with the repercussions of our sin or our disobedience. And that's that's prideful behavior that we need to make sure we nip in the bud. OK, so sin, slavery, supplication, and then we see in uh, the fourth step of that cycle of sin is salvation, where God will bring deliverance. He does that through the judges. We're going to see seven different cycles of that, where God will have grace and mercy on the people. He'll he'll you know he'll he'll show pity to them. He'll raise up a leader. The leader will provide deliverance. Then they'll then they'll lead into the next step, which is security. And then because things are good and peaceful and things are not hard, um, 
they'll fall right back into the same thing where they'll find themselves back in sin because things were easy and then they'll go through the cycle again. Okay, so this is the cycle. We talked about this a little bit last week. This is the cycle that has to be broken in order to spiritually mature. And we see so many Christians today or so many people come to find a faith, but then they live the remainder of their life in the cycle of sin. And by doing that, eventually they lead to they lead themselves into disobedience. And then as a result of that, you know, they, they walk away from the promise because God said that if we're going to be his, if we're going to be purchased, we have to overcome sin. Now, he's not telling us that we have to do it on our own, right? We understand that we can't do that. That's not something that we're capable of doing. But part of the command is, you know, walk holy, walk righteous, right? Be set apart from sin. And he said, not only do I want you to do that, but I'm going to do it in your life, right? So the failure is on our part because he's not leaving us you know, empty handed when he says to go and do something, he facilitates and gives us the power and gives us the resources to do that. So if you end up in that continual cycle, then eventually you're, you're going to ignore God's grace. And what we talked about last week is, you know, you're going to walk away or you're going to lose that inheritance. Okay. And that would lead us into the third section, which is the disgrace at the very end of the book, where we see the Danite retreat um, because they weren't following after the Lord. They lost the inheritance that God told them that they were supposed to be taking. But because they were continually dealing with the sin, they were they were dealing with disobedience and they were compromising with the people that were in the land. Um, after a certain period of time, we talked about the fact that if you reject God enough, that grace will run out. Now, that's not to say if you ever repent, God's going to tell you no. But the concept is when you decide that you're not going to listen to him and when you decide that you're not going to be obedient and do it his way, it will get to a point where he'll stop trying to pull you in. Right. Because you've decided what you want in your heart. And that leads to the concept that if you're for God, he's going to be for you. But if you ignore him and, and reject him enough, then you're going to be against God and then he's going to be against you. Okay. Leslie, raise your hand. Yeah, I had a quick question. This might be a, a dumb question, but I kind of get scared sometimes. How, how do I tell, like, if I'm stuck in a cycle of sin and maybe, like, I'm unaware, you know, because I just, uh, I, I get scared sometimes. Like, God will bring me scripture and. I'll have to read it a couple times, really pray on it to see if he's actually like, I'm getting corrected or if I'm just like condemning myself and like reading too much into it. I know there's grace and his love and his mercy, but you know, sometimes I just, I'm like, man, maybe I'm messing up real bad and I don't even know it. So yeah, that's my question. Well, the promise that he's given to us is he's not going to try to hide the fact that there's a problem in our life, right? When God is working in our life and we have the Holy Spirit guiding us and teaching us and he's counseling us and we're finding truth and things like that, we see that progress. God's not just going to ignore sin in our life and hope that we catch on, right? Especially if we're being proactive. If you're spending time with him, if you're, if you're seeking that stuff out, he's promised that the Holy Spirit will convict us of issues. So all we really need to make sure that we're doing is asking him to show us where those problems are, and he's going to be faithful to show us. So we don't need to worry and be scared that there's going to be some hidden thing that's going to keep us in, from the presence of, you know, of, of God in our life. But what we do need to be concerned of is where is our mentality? You know, are we content with how things are? Or are we always seeking, you know, more righteousness, more holiness, you know, more of a set apart life? And when we do that, God's promised that he'll be faithful on his end to show us where the problems are. And then it's on us to give them to him and let him, you know, overcome those in our life. Okay, so you don't need to be worried about that. That's not God's character. He's not trying to hide things, you know, to try and see if you're going to, you know, figure them out or see if they're a problem. He may be working on developing character. He may be putting you through phase of uh, testing for development. You know, he may be testing your faith to see if you're relying or trusting in him. But that's one of the things that, that as a Christian, we can have an assurance of is if we have the Holy Spirit in our life, he's going to convict us of things that are going to keep us from him. Okay. So at the end of the day, that's your assurance as he has promised. He will tell us if there is a problem in our life, because again, you know, he can't, he resists the proud. And he's not going to he's not going to um, cohabitate with sin in our life. Those are two constants that we can always guarantee in Scripture. So if we choose sin and we haven't heard from him and he's not counseling us and he's not answering prayers, then I would say, yeah, there's a concern, right? If you don't see that interaction with him, that's a problem, right? And you go to him and you ask, and maybe if you need to fast, then you fast. But you go to him with a repentant heart, looking for the the things that are a problem, so that you can eliminate them. But just knowing you. That's, I don't see that type of behavior where you're flippant towards God, where you're trying to like, you know, ignore sin or issues in your life. I think you're just going through development and testing. And so don't, you know, don't let Satan try to plant a seed of doubt where you've got some hidden sin that you can't find and God's not going to tell you what it is. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, and that's kind of what he had shown me. I was telling your dad about it, too, about the whole Mm -hmm. testing. And like you have said, with Joseph, he needed to mature, and David needed correction. So they were all, even though they had these years of just, like, horrible stuff, it was it was for a reason. So, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. No, and, and we're going to go through that. You know, God, um, if you look at all the people that he, he works on and he works through, there's always that period of refining. There's always that period of trials and the period where it's going to be, you know, he's developing your character. He's developing your trust and your faith in him so that when you're in the fire, you're not trying to figure it out as you go along. Right. You're already prepared for those things. So, when I look at those things in my own life, it's one of those things where you can rejoice because God doesn't work on people that he doesn't have a relationship with. That's just how it works. He's not going to refine you. He's not going to test you. He's not going to start to try to develop things in you if you don't have a relationship with him. He does that with his children. And so even if it's struggle, even if it's painful, even if it's something that's kind of a trial that you're going through, that's something to rejoice about because he only does that with his kids. right? He only does that with people who are working for him. And so even in that pain, we can have that rejoice or we can have that joy and have that kind of that mentality where we want to rejoice because it's exclusive to his children. That's something that he's doing through us in the good and in the bad. Okay, so hopefully that's encouraging. Now, some of the themes for the book of Judges. First one is obviously lack of godly leadership will result in adopting the world's standards. Um, This will result in getting trapped in the sin cycle that we had talked about. And if we fail to overcome the sin slash disobedience cycle, we run the risk of losing our inheritance. This can cause division and infighting in the body, which we see in the in the tribes that are fighting at the end of Judges, where they're coming against each other and killing each other because they weren't completely obedient to the command that God had given to them. And they had compromised and their standards were met with the world's and they weren't God's standards that they had upheld. Okay, Judges 17.6 can be a good summation of the entire book. Um, you know, I, you can write a reference to that at the beginning of the book, just, you know, judges equals, you know, judges 17, six says, and in those days there was no King in Israel and every man did what was right in their own eyes. You know, that's really, you know, the lack of leadership, them, you know, them defining their own standards when it comes to how they should be worshiping and following God. That's a good description of, of what was going on and the problem that they continually had. And that's why we can look at the generation today and pretty much draw the same parallel because it's the same thing. There's not a lot of godly leadership, discipling, mentoring, counseling people into the ways of God. It's more of everyone's just kind of doing what they want and they make their own denomination and they try to figure it out. They're being led by themselves. They're not led by the Holy Spirit. And so you have a thousand different denominations that are all in disagreement as to what the truth entails. And they're really defining their own terms as to this is what I want God to be in the Bible versus the Holy Spirit's going to lead us and show us what the truth is authored, because as we understand, there is only one interpretation of Scripture that is correct, and that's the one that God authored, and that's the truth that we can find through the Holy Spirit. Okay, there's no compromise on that. And a lot of people today are too willing to compromise for the sake of getting along and saying, well, we can't know for sure. That, to me, is just a sign that that person is not being led by the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is promised to lead us into all truth, is what Scripture says. Okay? And that, it's not going to be easy, Right, It can be difficult to get there, but if we're diligent, just like all of the wisdom books tell us, if we seek it out with all of our being, if we're hungry for his wisdom and understanding, God said he would be there to meet us and to provide that. Okay, um, So we looked at chapter 1. Let's do a quick review of chapter 1. This is focused on the political background of what's going on in Israel before the time of the judges. Verse 1, we see the lack of clearly defined leadership leaves people vulnerable. We see in verses 4 through 10, we see some good leadership traits, Right, kind of a little bit of an outline for success. Right, we see power, authority given to Judah. Um, Judah immediately creates a team with Simeon, and they go and they work together. Right, so he's got a team. He's got people he can. Excuse me. <clears throat> he's got a team he can delegate to. So that's one of the first things that a good leader should do: is not take on everything and not trust other people that are that are on the same side. Good leadership will 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 create a good team surrounding them so that they can work together and that they can delegate. And we're actually going to look at the example of King Elgon today that Ehud comes up against and why that's an issue if you don't do that. Um, We see that they kept pushing forward towards the goal, towards the vision. We see them going through and conquering, finding some success, and then they continue to push through, right? Joshua had that problem where he got sick of success and they started to kind of pull back a little bit because they were getting tired of the winning. 
which is something that you would think is kind of crazy to, to deal with. But, you know, if we're in his shoes, it may be something that we might experience as well. And then we see the third one, that motivation for the team and for the followers is going to be an important characteristic for the leaders. You know, when we first started looking into this book, and Leslie mentioned this last study, when we look at the examples of what's going on with the judges and the leaders of this time, we do well for ourselves if we pay attention to what the good things entail, because the next step in the plan during Jesus's kingdom is that those who are faithful will be put into positions of authority and he will prepare those for those positions now. So if we're looking at a biblical standard of what a good leader looks like, God can use us for those leadership positions. Okay, and that's what we're going to see in the book of Judges is we're going to see snippets of this is what a good leader does and this is what a good leader looks like in the context of God's definition of a leader. Remember, we're not trying to, to pin the world standard of good leadership and make it fit into the Bible. We're looking at God defines these people as good leaders, so let's find out what he defines them as, how they behave, and then work to have him develop those in our life. Because as the New Testament tells us, our hope and our future is the kingdom being inherited with Jesus and taking rule and uh, taking authority on with him. And that would obviously be uh, good for us to, to prepare in advance with that wisdom. Okay. Um, examples of obstacles to success. We start to see after verse 10, kind of 11 and moving forward. Um, the first one is Judah and Simeon uh, did not dispossess the people, the Canaanites that were living in the Philistine plain because of the technology, right? Because of their iron uh, chariots that they had. The principle for that one is a lack of faith caused disobedience. Okay, this reminds me of Zechariah. When we were going through Zechariah, one of the concepts that we continually looked at were things are not as they appear, but they are as God says they are. If you lose focus of who your God is and you get tripped up in how things look before you, you're going to you're going to lead yourself into disobedience because God is expecting to do the impossible through the things that are un, unexpected and unreasonable. So when we look at circumstances that are bigger than our control and bigger than our understanding, if we take that into account, we're going to basically uh, uh, allow doubt to cause us to be disobedient. And God's going to allow that to happen. There are Christians today who God will call to do things. And because of their small faith, they will become disobedient and not do what he called them to do. That's what we see in the example of Judah and Simeon. The sons of Benjamin did not dispossess the Jebusites that were living in Jerusalem. And scripture tells us that they were still living there to that day when this was being authored. So, so they didn't do this at the initial onset of the time of the judges, right? The Benjaminites did not do what God called them to do and dispossess them. And to the day that this was written, which we figured was around the time of Saul's coronation, all the way up to the monarchy, the Jebusites were still living in Jerusalem with, with the tribe of Benjamin. So this one was disobedience led to changing the plan from God's orders to their will. They compromised, right? They decided, oh, well, I know God said it's like just like with Saul, right? God says to wipe him out. Saul says, oh, well, I kept the leadership and all the good stuff so I could offer it as a sacrifice. And God says obedience is better than sacrifice. So they failed there. We see that the house of Joseph was actually seeing success because they were being obedient. Right. They were going through. They were doing what God called them to do. And because God was with them, just like he was with everybody else, they had a big enough faith to finish the job that God called them to do. And then we see at the end of the chapter, many of the tribes failed to obey God's commands and they did not drive out the people. And as a result, they did not inherit the full inheritance God told them to. OK, so the application principle, there are people who will be Christians and who will call themselves Christians who will be disobedient because they have small faith because they don't know who the God is that they serve. Okay, what, as a Christian, what is that a result of? Why would we have a small faith? What would we be not doing in order to have a small faith on who our God is that we serve? What habits wouldn't we have in our life? A lack of relationship with God and spending time with him and prayer and uh, reading, fasting, all that. Yeah, and that's, yeah, Lauren says the same thing in the comments, not reading the word. That's exactly right. It all starts with the word. If you don't study the word, you don't know who he is. You don't know what his promises are. You don't, you don't see his faithfulness. You can't understand his character. And as a result, you literally will not see any success in your real world life because you're not building any faith to be able to step out into. Okay. So if you're dealing with Christians who have a small faith and as a result are being disobedient, you know that it's going to, it's going to be as a result of the foundation of not studying their word. Okay. 
Now, there's going to be people who are Christians who will compromise and be disobedient as a result of it. They will compromise their standards. They will compromise what God has called them to do. I don't think we really need to find any specific examples, but that the American church is a pretty good picture of compromise today. Right? You have churches that have, you know, beer, they have get-togethers, they have gambling nights that are led by the pastors, right? They're they're dealing and going to places that they shouldn't be and doing things that they shouldn't be because there's no godly leadership and they they're supposed to be Christians, but they're the ones that are compromising and as a result, that compromise leads to disobedience. Okay? There are people who are Christians who will be obedient and who will be getting it right. And I put in parentheses in my notes that that's going to be a very small percentage of people even among the ranks of Christians. Because it is, it is hard, and it requires discipline, and it requires dying to flesh, and it, it requires painful things in order to be obedient and get it right, because you have to develop a faith, and that's not always going to be easy. So very few Christians will be getting it right, but when we identify the ones that are, we need to make sure that we team up with them. Okay? When we see those types of people, we need to pay attention to what they're doing, and we need to make sure that they're a resource in our own life, because that is who we need to have ac uh, access to, and that's who we need to have uh, influencing our ability to grow and our ability to mature, right? So many people today just have the lowest standard when it comes to people who are Christians that they associate themselves with. They don't study the scriptures, who don't spend time in prayer, who aren't counseled by God, who don't care about God's truth, who are willing to compromise with the world, who want to keep sin in their lives, and yet they call themselves Christians, and so they feel good going to Bible studies, and they feel good letting them influence their beliefs, and all they're doing is damaging themselves. They're hurting their chances of seeing success and making it through the hard things that are going to come down the pipeline because there's no faith that's developed. Lauren, do you have something you want to say? Yeah. Do you think that, well, we know lack of love for the Lord leads to disobedience? 1,000%. Okay. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. If, you, if you don't, and I think part of that also stems from the word, right? If you don't understand... Right what he's done for us and, and how we don't deserve the things that he blesses us with and all of this stuff that, you know, he shows us through his grace. It's easy to kind of fall into a contentment with, yeah, well, God's there. What do I care? Right. right? And that's, that's a lot. That's kind of the attitude you see for a lot of Christians is what we see in judges. I'm going through something tough. Hey, God, get me out of it. And then as soon as he does and things are okay, they just go straight back to sin. Cause I think like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and true faith is a true love for the Lord. Yeah, it'll, and that's why Jesus tells us that if we love him, we're going to be obedient, not just because he's a slave driver and trying to get us to do tasks because that's who he is. It's we have a love for him, and it's going to show in servitude, right? Biblical love is not a feeling. Biblical right. love it's is a, a servitude. Yeah. yeah, it's an action, right? Because right. we love him, we do these things. Because he loved us, he did what he did on the cross, right? right? So we, and that's, I think, kind of that, that point should be well taken because a lot of people in the church today think that love— that is talked about in the Bible is I feel good about God. I have admiration for God and I feel warm and fuzzy internally, but they don't have the biblical version of love where they're willing to self-sacrifice and they're willing to have action to serve God as a result of their love, which is really what we see described in Jesus and described in, in the love that God had for us. So, right. so yeah, that's absolutely 100% true. Okay. And then the last point for the application is people who are Christians will change the plan and as a result be disobedient. And this is in context of the group that said, hey, you know, we didn't drive them out, but better yet, we made them slaves, right? We turned them into slaves for us. We know that that's not something that God called them to do. And we see that in the churches today. God says to do this. And people will say, well, our checkbook won't allow for it. So we're going to go ahead and alter the plan a little bit. And then we're just going to assume that it was successful when we can do what we wanted to, you know, based on our ability or, or our budget um, or our talents or our resources. And God says, well, you know, again, that's disobedience and you're changing the plan, which is not something that I've ever asked you to do. Right. When he tells us to do something, we do it his way. If we, if we can't see the end line, right, if we can't see the end zone, we can't see the plan of attack to figure out how it's going to work. That's fine. We step out in faith because it's God's plan and he's going to facilitate success. So the overarching concept is we have to remain focused on what God has called us to do in spite of what we're going to see in the church and what believers are or are not doing. We will see believers in the church who have a, who have a genuine faith, but because their faith is small, they're going to be disobedient. We're going to see believers in the church who have had a walk with God for a long time. But, but they're willing to compromise and they're not willing to do the things that God called them to do. We're going to see people who are Christians, who have been Christians, who have, you know, they're seasoned. They've been in the church for a long time. 
But whenever God calls them to do something, they always want to change it to their will and not to God's will. And there, there's this partial obedience, which at the end of the day is just disobedience. But then we're also going to encounter Christians who will get it right, who are on fire for God, and who have a spiritual maturity that can't be measured. And we will see those people, and we will want to make sure that we are on their team and on their side because they will help us to grow. Okay? So, the reason that I say that, you should write that down. We have to remain focused on what God has called us to do in spite of what other believers are or are not doing because the, the closer we walk with God and the further down the road we get into this end of the age, right, the bad things that are going to come down the road, we are going to have to be okay with being more isolated from even just the body because we're going to be walking alone with God. We have to be okay with that. That is one of the harsh realities of being a Christian is the more you want to draw near to God, the further away from people you're going to get, you're going to be cut off from the world. But one thing that people don't talk about is you're also going to be isolated from the church because the general majority of the church isn't cut out to be leadership. They're not cut out to walk close with God. They're not cut out to have the gifts of the spirit. They're not cut out and trustworthy to be led and basically be walking side by side with God in their life and having their footsteps directed by him. They're just, it's just, and we can say, well, that sucks. And we, we would, we, you know, we want to be optimistic about it, but we also don't want to fool ourselves. And, and the reality is that there are few people, there are so few people that love God to a degree where they're willing to die to everything and cut off whatever it takes. If that includes the, the, the church that you're in, if that includes, you know, a lifelong relationship with someone that was you were close with, but at the end of the day, that person isn't willing to go as far to get to God as you are. Are you willing to go through that pain and, and cut those ties in order to draw near to God? Right? And and if we kind of back up a little bit, we talk about judges and, and looking at this as development for leadership, then we need to realize that for as few people who are called an answer to seek truth. An even smaller percentage of that, an even fewer amount of people are called to leadership. Okay, and I'm not saying, and by saying that, I'm not just, you know, I'm not authorizing everybody on this phone call that, you know, God's God said that you're going to be leadership 100%. But I would say the fact that you're in this group and the fact that God is working in your life through this group, there's a good chance that He's preparing you for the things that are too hard for other people to do, and and it's it's things that people are not, you know, they don't have a firm enough faith to step out and to do. And that's not to say they don't have the potential, and that's not to say that God doesn't want to use them to that degree, but the harsh reality is, and we see this through judges, even if you are a Christian, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be a successful leader, or you're going to be a successful Christian that can have a great impact for the sake of God. Because the, the, the distance that you have to go to be able to be trustworthy and remain in God's presence daily in your life requires doing things that even the general church isn't willing to do. Praying and fasting and disciplining yourself and dying to sin and cutting off toxic relationships and staying away from places that you shouldn't be going and continually denying your flesh so that you can remain in the presence of the Spirit in your life, so that you can seek after truth and day in and day out you meditate with God and you let Him counsel you. That is a walk that, that few are called to. That doesn't mean that the other Christians aren't going to go to heaven. That doesn't mean that they're not genuinely saved. It just means that at the end of the day, there are very few people that are willing to answer the additional call to be someone that can be trustworthy by God, who can be meek enough to be a leader, and someone that can stand out of the way to give God the glory. And we can even see the people that are called to leadership in the book of Judges, they're not even seeing 100% success. So that's something that we need to take before the Lord. That's something we need to let him counsel us in, is am I taking this seriously? Am I willing to do that? Excuse me, Nib. And if I'm not, then we need to be able to submit some of that to the Lord and say, I need you to develop this in me. I need you to work on these weaknesses in me. And the whole overarching concept of that is, if you do that, if you're willing to go that extra mile, then God's going to glorify himself in you. Right? Is, one, is your prayer in your alone time with God, is it, Lord, make me, turn me into someone that could be a good example that's written about in Scripture? Lord, can you use me for those types of things? Can you develop me into someone that can do those things? Right? And that's kind of rhetorical, but that's hopefully to get you guys to think. You know, what are you doing in your alone time with the Lord? What is the vision? What is the goal? Are you just doing this to try and survive? Or are you trying to do this to be an overcomer that can be a leader? Someone that can be on God's team and be trustworthy with the things that he wants us to be doing and to be that resource for other people? Because I'll tell you what, if you read through the end times uh, content that we've been through and that we're going to continue to go through. 
there's actually special blessings for people who are willing to find wisdom and to be leaders in the end times. There's additional benefits to it. Right, Daniel tells us that those who are wise in the end times, those who are going to be leading those to the truth, those who are going to be that beacon of light in, com in complete and total darkness during the tribulation, that they're going to be established when Jesus returns, they're going to shine as bright as stars and they're going to be established forever. That's what the scripture says, what Daniel says. So the question is, are you willing to take your walk with God serious enough to step up to that calling? Because, again, kind of the adult concept or that hard to swallow pill is, God will let you fail if you decide that you don't want to stand up to that calling. And that's not to say God's going to be mean, and that's not to, going to say, you know, God's you know, going to try to make you fail or he's going to facilitate failure in your life. But there's kind of a line that's drawn. If you, if you want to follow God, you have to follow his standards. And then if you want to be a leader for God, you have to step up and follow his standards to be a godly leader. And if you want to be a teacher for God, you have to be willing to step up to the standard that he has set. And each time... You take that step, it's further and further away from the world and further and further away from people who self-title themselves as Christians, and it's going to be closer and closer in your walk with God. And your faith will grow as a result of it, your understanding, your peace, all of the benefits of having God in your life will grow, but it is a hard walk, and you will fail. But how you, how you handle that failure and how you get back up and how soon you do it will determine whether or not God's going to be able to assign those difficult tasks to you because you're going to show yourself trustworthy. Okay, and again, this is not to talk down to people who are still baby Christians, who are still struggling, who are still in the cycle of sin, but there is a hard reality that you can step up to the calling or you can go ahead and dismiss it because you're scared or because you're, you're worried or you don't think you're trustworthy or for whatever reason that Satan may insert that seed of doubt into your life about. Okay, and that's kind of a rabbit trail, but to review that point as we get further down the road in the plan, with the end times and the tribulation, we will be more and more isolated if we want to draw near to God. Okay, you look at the great leaders, you look at the great examples of, of what God did through the Old Testament, you look at these people, a lot of times it was one person on God's side, and it was a complete nation against them. Are you willing to walk that far with God, is the question at the end of that. Okay, so... On a lighter note, any questions on chapter one of the introduction? Okay, let's go ahead and go through chapter two. So in chapter two, we're going to break this into two sections at the beginning here. The first is going to be generation number one, and the second one's going to be generation number two. Generation number one is in verses one through ten. This generation had a direct promise from God, and we're going to notice a couple of characteristics that they had. Um, that are going to be a benefit um, that was good for them. This is basically the Joshua generation, right? And then we're going to look at generation number two, which is in verses 10b, second half of verse 10 up to verse 17. So let's go ahead and read 1 through 10. It says, And the angel of Jehovah came up from Gilgal to the place of weeping and said, I caused you to come out of Egypt and brought you into the land which I had sworn to your fathers and said, I will not break my covenant with you forever. And you... You shall cut no covenant with the ones living in this land. You shall break down their altars. You have not listened to my voice. Or wait, yet you have not listened to my voice, I should say. What is this you have done? So what we see here is they had a relationship with God. right? God brought them out. They saw God working. They saw his miracles. They weren't perfect, but they knew him. Okay, This needs to be an understood point because we see here God says, You haven't listened to my voice. What is it you've done? This is essentially, in modern terms, we're not going to get it perfect every time, but when we do fail, God's going to correct us, right? Scripture tells us he, he chastises those that he loves. That's what we see here. He's, he's talking to them and saying, you didn't listen to my voice. What is it that you've done so that he can basically teach them they've been disobedient and they've sinned, and then we're going to see them repent in the next couple of verses. This is an indicating factor of someone who is in showing that love that Lauren had mentioned, showing the love that they have for the Lord, because they're going to repent of their sin. They're not going to repent of the pain as a result of their sin. Okay, so that's the first thing is this first generation, they had a relationship with God. And as a result of that, God has promised us, if we have the Holy Spirit, he's going to convict us and teach us when we fail. Okay, that's part of the benefit of being in a relationship with God. If we don't, if we reject him, he hasn't promised to do those for us. Right, if we look at Proverbs 1, because we did Proverbs a little bit ago, and I wanted to, I actually thought of this when we were, or when I was putting my notes together, but Proverbs chapter 1, 
verses 23 through 28. It writes, turn back at my warning. Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And because I called and you refused, I stretched out a hand and no one inclined. But you have ignored all my counsel. You did not desire my warning. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when you dre- when your dread comes. And when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity arrives like a tempest, when distress and anguish come on you, then they shall call on me and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. If we reject God's grace, then he said, that's fine. Right? You're going to get what you want. And then when you do call on my name, when it's too late, when you're facing judgment, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. You're going to call on me and you're going to receive mocking in, in, in return. Because you didn't heed my warnings. And so that's one of, that's kind of the principle that we're going to see with this first generation is because they had a relationship with them, they repented of their sin and they had a relationship and God is correcting and chastising them. Okay, so they had the direct promise from God in verse one. We said that they, they were disobedient. We see his response in verse two. Then in verses three through five, he says, and I have also said, I shall not dispossess them before you and they shall come, they shall become adversaries to you. And their gods shall become a snare to you. And it happened when the angel of Jehovah spoke these words to all the sons of Israel. The people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim and sacrificed to Jehovah there. Bochim means the place of weeping. That's the image of repentance. They did wrong. God, God convicted them. And as a result, they repented of the sinful disobedience that they had done. That's an indication of a valid and a genuine relationship with God because one, there's repentance, and two, God is is correcting them, okay? So the first generation people, which we see described here, they're not perfect, and they'll go out and they'll mess up, but when they do, God will convict them and use them on the tail end of the screw-up if they respond to the rebuke positively. That's the same truth that we get to apply to our lives. Right. If we're newly born again, if we're just if we've just found the truth of the Lord, we're going to go out and we're going to try and be obedient and we're going to fail. We're going to try to avoid sin and we're going to fail. But what God's promised is that he's going to convict us when we do and he's going to rebuke and correct us. And if we can respond accordingly, right, with humility, with with that hunger for correction, with wanting to do better, then God can use us even when we screw up. He can use us on the tail end of that and it can be something that can glorify him. But that's a that's an indicator of a genuine relationship that he has with us. Now we're going to see in starting in verse six, and Joshua sent the people away and the sons of Israel, each went to his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served Jehovah all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who prolonged their days after Joshua, who saw all the great work of Jehovah, which he had done for Israel. So he's saying, and these people, because they turned from their ways and they ended up serving Jehovah all of their days, all the days of Joshua, and as well, all of the elders at the time of Joshua, they saw the work of Jehovah and they also served him because they saw what he had done for Israel. And then it says in verse 8, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Jehovah, died, being a son of 110 years. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hills of Ephraim, on the north of Mount Gash. And also that generation was gathered to their fathers. So the generation of Joshua saw God move. They had faults, they had struggles, but they matured in their relationship with God until their generation died off. So when Joshua died, it tells us that the rest of the generation also died off, right? All of that generation was gathered to their fathers. That doesn't mean they all died at the same time. It just means that enough time had passed eventually that everyone from that generation died off, okay? Their primary mistake was, as we had mentioned, they didn't discipleship and the next generation was not taught and developed to love God. How do we know? Second, second half of verse 10, and another generation arose after them who had not known Jehovah, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So now we start to look at this second generation. Okay, this is verses 11 through 17 here. They did not have a heart for God. They had a record of God's working through their fathers, but they didn't know it themselves. Right, So the generation before them got to experience God's power. They got to be delivered from bondage. They got to see these things that God was doing through them, you know, offering victory, um, all of that fun stuff that we see recorded through the Torah. And they have all the record of it because they have the writings and everything like that, but they themselves didn't experience it. And we don't see that discipleship. So the combination of those two things leads into what we see in, in verse 16. Um, 
or I guess, sorry, verse 11, when it says, and the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of Jehovah and served the Baals. Right, so 10 tells us they didn't know Jehovah. They knew they didn't even really know the works that he had done because they didn't experience it. And so because they didn't experience God, what happened was they substituted God's standards for the ones of their surroundings. This is the pattern, rinse and repeat, that's cyclical throughout all of history is if you do not disciple the next generation in God's standards, they're going to adopt the standards that are immediately available around them. Okay, so we're setting up the next generation for failure if we don't do our job and disciple. That's something that, as from a leadership perspective, again, we have to make sure as part of our ministry is not just winning people to the Lord, but having an outlet for them to be developed and to be discipled based on God's truth. Let's talk really quickly. What would discipleship entail? What are a couple of high points? If you were to put together a ministry that was just focused on discipling people, what are a couple of the things that you would make sure are in there? What are some things you would want to make sure were completed as part of that? Well, as you're, oh, did, in, did anybody else want to go first? No, you can. Go ahead, Leslie. Oh, well, like as you're, I think, I forgot who said it. If it was you or your dad pointing them to Christ is number one, but two, checking up on them, making sure they have resources available. Like uh, one thing I do is I share um, these notes that I take with other people that are in different countries so mm -hmm. they can, because sometimes they don't always watch a church service or listen to this audio so the notes are sometimes more convenient so they mm -hmm. study those and then they they know like with one person they believe in the pre-trib uh tribulation but since i've known them for years and you know they get help and they get notes and stuff i think they're starting to open their eyes and it's not even by me just you know forcing it down their throat it's just by constantly saying in the notes there's no pre-trib um rapture this is why so they're looking at it and then knowing me and knowing i'm consistent and like you know, I'm searching out God and I'm helping. So I think all that together is helping them with discipleship and they're getting fed and they're seeing miracles in my life. And, you know, they're going through it and then they're, you know, in turn doing for others what was done for them. So it's like a reoccurring cycle. So that's, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Yeah. So being a good support. Right. Not just leaving them to it like, OK, cool. I gave you the gospel. Good luck with it. Go figure it out. But being an ongoing support system, that's going to be something a good leader is going to need to do. Um, I liked what you shared on that as well as being consistent. A good example. You have to be a good example for them to follow after. You can't just say this is what the Bible says. Go and do it and then go and live a life that's the opposite of what a godly leader should look like. Right. Even not a leader, just a godly person in general. Right. Ruining your testimony by not being a good example is going to hurt your ability to disciple others. What are we going to say, Lauren? Um, the truth of God's word and uh, the fruits of the spirit. Yes. Guiding them to the understanding of what God's word actually has. Excuse me. Right. Being able to defend the truth that, that goes back to not just having a developed testimony, but knowing the word well enough and knowing the truth of the word to be able to help provide correction. OK, that's one of the things that we mentioned last week when we were talking about a lack of good leadership today is there are not people who there are. There is a lack of leaders in the body that cannot draw a hard line with confidence to say this is what the truth of God's word is and this is what the truth of God's word is not. And that's why we have so much garbage floating around in churches today is because no one's willing to draw the line and actually side on truth because they don't even know if they found it themselves because they're trying to figure out what God's word says without the help of the author. God tells us there's an assurance that comes. There is a confidence that comes when the Holy Spirit teaches us a truth. And there's a bunch of checks and balances we can use to verify that it's actually the truth. Now, if we don't love the truth, we're not ever going to find it. And as a result, or that's going to be as a result of, of a lack of discipleship. So, and then having the fruit of the spirit kind of goes back into being a living testimony, but also knowing what those are used for in the body for edification and how to get them. People don't talk about the gifts of the spirit because they don't know how to get them. Right. It's too hard. They're not walking holy enough. They're not willing to sacrifice, you know, things in their life. They're not willing to pray and fast to get those things. And so they don't want to talk about them because it's too hard. What else? Is there anything else that you would have in a, in a discipleship program? Yeah, also being willing to uh, being honest with them, but also like <clears throat> helping them with their own sin, praying for them, but also even rebuking them. You know, if they see uh, they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing but with, with love, of course, and uh, showing them the way to do things by you walking with the spirit yourself. 100 percent. 
being able, so this, the cycle of sin that we're looking at, right? That example that a lot of baby Christians struggle with, being able to address that from a godly authoritative position. We see that in all of the letters of Paul. Well, I don't want to say all of them, uh, but to some degree, you see the evidence of Paul calling people out and calling a spade a spade when it comes to things like sin, right? He's not shy from it because he understands that if he's not willing to develop a, a more righteous and holy walk in the people that are following after him, they're going to basically stumble and they're going to get caught up in the same si sin cycle that we're seeing described here all the way back in Judges. So that's excellent, right? Being able to have a stern authority and a confidence to lovingly, right? Not abrasive, not being rude, not being accusatory, not being condemning, but being serious, right? There's a difference. You, I think maybe, and I don't know if everybody here has experienced it, but there's sometimes in your life where you're going to run into someone who is an authority figure, who is stern and straightforward, but there's someone that you can kind of um, admire because they're not abrasive about it and they know how to address things head on without damaging the person, right? It's about the issue and it's about teaming up to tackle the issue. It's not about being accusatory and saying the person is a problem and making them feel bad about it, if that makes sense. Cheryl, you got your hand raised? Oh, yes. Um, to go along with that um, in discipleship, uh, you want to be praying with them constantly, you know, praying for them, fasting for them, and also sharing. Um, one of the things that I've done is, or that the Lord has had me do um, since I am an older person and I've been walking with the Lord since I was seven um, is I share my mistakes where I've made mistakes like when I was prideful you know when I went when I was disobedient um, just different things you know as I'm discipling someone I see where they are in their walk with Christ and if they're going through some things that I was going through in my baby walk I try to share where I messed up and where the Lord brought me through it and the lessons that he taught me through his word. Yeah, that's, and that's something I think is going to be a requirement for anybody that's going to be a resource because that's your testimony and God's going to bring people to you that need to hear that. And that'll be a sign of your maturity is can you not, can you truthfully and honestly share that testimony so that it can be a benefit for the sake of somebody else who's struggling with it. Because if you deal with a Christian teacher or a Christian leader who is perfect and spotless and will never share mistakes, that would be something in my book. This is just my opinion. That would be kind of a red flag for me um, because I would, I mean, I would, and this again, it's just me, but I would think that maybe they haven't even gotten over it if they're not willing to share it. They're trying to hide it. If they're not willing to, to give God the glory for being able to break that, there's a good chance that they're still struggling with something like that. And that's not to say again, you know, that that's a problem and that invalidates their, their walk and they're not, they don't actually have an authentic faith, but given the opportunity to give God the glory for the things he's done in your life should be, you know, that first and foremost is part of our testimony. So a good leader should be willing to do that as well. So that's a pretty good list. Um, I would say when it comes to, you know, developing and discipleship. So always be thinking about that kind of stuff. Cheryl, your hand's still up. Did you have another comment? Are you okay? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, and Lawrence is building them up and encouraging them in faith, motivating them, being that, that kind of goes back into Leslie's comment about being a good resource, checking in on them, especially when they first come to know the Lord, because they're going to be attacked and they're going to have struggles. They're not going to know what they need to be doing because they're still trying to learn. They're just an infant. And, you know, just like we wouldn't just have a baby and then leave it in the world to go and figure it out, the same for a baby Christian, right? We wouldn't just leave them to their own to figure things out. They need a support system. And that's why there's the body of Christ. That's why it's set up the way that it is. That's why he uses us the way that he does is so that the next generation isn't left on their own to try and figure it out from scratch. Okay. So, um, because they didn't experience God, they substituted his standards for the ones of their surroundings. We'll see that immediately in the sons of Israel in verse 11, did evil in the sight of Jehovah and served the Baals. They forsook Jehovah, the God of their fathers who brought them out from the land of Egypt. And they went after other gods. And then it specifically says the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves to them and angered Jehovah. Yea, they forsook Jehovah and served Baal and Ashtaroth. We see this today. Um, without the standard of God, the standard becomes whatever is immediately around them in the world, right? They went after the, pag the people around them. We see this today as kind of a plague in the church uh, because, again, we're still missing the godly leadership and the godly discipleship. I guess I would add to the group of, of, of everything that you guys shared, um, self-discipline. 
Paul talks about it, running the race, disciplining himself so he doesn't ruin his testimony. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that people struggle with today, both in and outside of the church, is being able to discipline yourself against yourself. And that's one of the, that's literally kind of the foundation of the word discipleship, disciplining the group following you to follow the ways of Jehovah. And that means, you know, denying yourself, dying to your flesh and being able to, to develop and keep, um, you know, good habits from a, from a Christian worldview, right? Adhering to the standards of God's ways and being able to discipline yourself to them because there will be difficult things that we will face, temptation, lust, impulse. And if we don't discipline ourselves, we're going to fail to those. We're going to fall to those and we will fail because of those every time. So I would add that to that list is that discipline, self-discipline, what's called temperance, what Peter refers to as temperance. And Paul writes about self-discipline that that has to happen as part of that discipleship process. Okay. Now it's kind of a little bit of a, a side, um, a side, a side track there. This is an issue that's in the church today, and without the godly leadership and the, disip- the discipleship and the mentoring, we have children and kids who attend church, but they have standards that have been adopted from social media and from entertainment. They know how to go to church. They know how to put on the religious outward attitude. But at the end of the day, the way that they live in their internal person is, is prideful, is greedy, is lustful. Is, is there are people who gossip, right? It's, it's immediately developed by the things that are around them. And that's why social media has been such a terrible influence on people who are Christians, because you have immediately available worldwide standards from all different cultures and all different peoples, and it will spread like a wildfire. And it does, and it has through the church, where you have these Eastern mystical principles and these things from the, um, the uh, um, Middle Eastern religions. And you have, um, you know, some of the... Uh, like the indigenous belief systems, like you have all this mystical and pagan idolatry that's, that's being introduced to these kids and they're grasping onto it because they're learning about it um, through social media, right? Because of the network of information that they have access to, they're practicing things from witchcraft and pagan practices and things from other cultures and Eastern mysticism. And that's the standard that's immediately available to them. And because they haven't been discipled in God's standards, those are the ones that they live their life by. And it is so hard to undo that damage in someone who has grown up, right? Yeah, New Age, Reiki, Yoga, all of that stuff that you can see that, that are, that's trending, that's cool to do, that people are trying to look to to find answers from, and none of it has to do with God. And these are people that are in the church. We're not even talking about people that are blatantly against God and who have rejected him or, or are atheistic and don't believe in him, right? And then we also have adults who were involved in church, same way, but they fornicate, right? They, have a, they, uh, they commit adultery, they gossip, they lie, and they're in the church because the standards that they live by, because there's no godly leadership to cut them off and to draw hard lines, right? To be able to say, this is what God says to do, and this is wrong, and if you're not doing it, they're not addressing sin. Yeah, Lauren says it's rampant in the church in America, 100%. The standards that they're living by is the same image of the Israelites taking on and serving the gods and the balls and the asteros of the people that are immediately around them. They're just adopting what's available and rejecting what was given by God to their fathers. Leslie, do you have a comment? Yeah. Something I see, because this is what happens. I see on like YouTube, like the Christians that are really on it, they're not going to have a lot of followers, but the ones that are maybe like the happy go lucky, you know what you, the easy life Christian, I want to say they get the millions of followers. And what I've seen, and I don't get this, I see these Christian couples, like married couples, and they're younger, maybe in their 20s or like early, late, you know, 30, whatever. And they'll do this trend where they'll, they'll do like the yoga challenge. And then they'll also do like, um, you know, they'll put makeup on their husband and they'll like make him look, you know, like, I don't know, like some kind of beauty makeover. I guess it's a trend. And I'm like, why are you putting makeup on him? And then I'm looking at the husband like, why are you letting her put the makeup on you? You're supposed to be like Christian. Like, yeah. You're supposed to know better. That I'm like, and then they think it's really cute and funny. And I'm just like, I don't know. I would never do that. And in the Bible, it clearly states, but it's just shocking that they do. I'm like, what church are you going to where that's okay? So I don't know. I've been seeing that. Yeah. And, and Justin uh, says your general desensitization, uh, desensitization to sin. Desensitization. Yeah. Did I say that right? Sorry. I'm having, it's a Monday. Uh, yeah. Right. You're basically just it's being it's it's co- it's that compromise. Right. Kind of goes back to chapter one where they're compromising with the people that are around them as opposed to con- completely kicking them out like God told them to. Let's pretend it's sin. You compromise with sin. You're going to go the wrong way in your relationship with God. 
Okay. And then when you choose disobedience, God can leave the effects of that decision in your life to test you to see if you're actually going to listen to him. Right. So it's just kind of a cyclical thing. God will leave it there. And if you don't respond accordingly, the way he, that you should be, then it's just going to continually snowball and get worse and worse and worse. Fast forward to today, look at the American quote unquote Christians who are supporting the LBGTQ movement, who are out there, um, you know, they're political with the Black Lives Matter stuff. They have nothing to do with the gospel. They're just about the love that Jesus showed. There's nothing to do with sin. There's no repentance. And they're welcoming in the sin and the standards of the world because, go back to square one, there's no godly leadership to define what they should and shouldn't be doing according to what's in the Bible because no one's done it themselves, right? And just kind of keep working backwards. You get a couple of generations that do well, they're on fire. Two generations later, they don't see God working. They adopt the standards of the world. They get themselves into trouble. They call it, they cry out. Unfortunately, towards the end of the age here, there's not a rescue in sight that's going to come before Jesus returns. It's just going to continue to get worse and it's going to be worse than it ever was before. And then Jesus will return and he'll clean house and all of it will go away. We're told in Isaiah, we're told in the, uh, the in Zechariah that the gods and the pagan uh uh, worship that's taking place that all goes away during christ's kingdom he's going to rule with an iron rod everyone will know god's name they'll either have god as the option or they'll have rebellion but there won't be satan there won't be false gods and there won't be these uh pagan practices taking place while jesus is here yes children are watching them they are leading the children that way also you have kids raising kids and they grow up to be kids that's what it is right if you're if you're going to summarize it okay so no godly leadership now we look in verse 15 Actually, verse 14, the anger of Jehovah glowed against Israel. He gave them into the hand of the plunderers, and they plundered them. He sold them into the hand of their enemies all around, and they were not able to stand before their enemies any longer. Wherever they went, the hand of Jehovah was against them for evil, as Jehovah had spoken, and as Jehovah had sworn to them, and it distressed them very much. Again, if you're for God, he's for you. If you are against God and you make that decision, he's going to be against you, i.e. verse 14 and 15. Wherever they went, the hand of Jehovah was against them for evil. Okay, as Jehovah had spoken, he's not just doing this randomly in that section, as Jehovah had spoken in Deuteronomy 28, verses 48 through 53, Leviticus 26, 17, Leviticus 26, 36 through 39, they have been given blatant promises where God says, there is a threat of punishment, I should say, there is a promise of punishment if you are disloyal to me. Because of the covenant we had made, you have to follow after me because I'm going to bless you. If you don't do it, there is a punishment that comes as a result of that. He's, he's calling back to that in Judges 2.15. Just as he had spoken, he was now fulfilling. Okay, God gives us his standard, and for whatever reason, people still choose to define their own, and many of them consider themselves to be believers. So when we are for God, he is for us, but when we are against him and working against him and rejecting him, he is going to do the same and reciprocate. Okay, we see in verse 16 and 17, and Jehovah raised up judges, they saved them from the hand of their plunderers, but they also did not listen to their judges, but went whoring after other gods and bowed themselves to them. They quickly turned aside out of the way in which their fathers walked to obey the commands of Jehovah. They did not do so. God uses the word whoring because he considers the covenant a marriage. He wed himself to Israel and they cheated on him with fake gods. They went and whored themselves out and committed adultery with other gods. That's what God looks at. And then in verse 18 and 19, you can highlight this, put a red, put a red box around it or whatever color helps you remember this, and right next to it, summary of chapters 3 through 16 in these two verses. This is the whole summation of the next handful of chapters until we get to, to 16. And then Jehovah raised up judges to them. Then Jehovah was with the judge and rescued them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For Jehovah took pity because of their groaning before their oppressors and those that crushed them, and the death of the judge, and at the death of the judge it happened, they would turn and act more corruptly than their fathers and go after other gods to serve them and to bow themselves to them. And they did not fall away from their own doings and from their stubborn way. Verse 18 and 19 is the entire reason God had to continue to send judges. They'd do well. Judge would save them. They'd get themselves into trouble. They'd cry out to God. God would show them pity. He'd, he'd provide another deliverer. But then as soon as that judge died, they would just go right back into it 10 times worse than they did the first time. So verses 20 through 23, we see the result of the disobedience. We see in the anger of Jehovah glowed against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and has not listened to my voice, I also from now on will not dispossess any of them from before the nations that Joshua left when he died. 
so that by them I may test Israel whether they are keeping the way of Jehovah to go in it as their fathers kept it or not. And Jehovah left those nations without dispossessing them quickly, and he did not deliver them into the hand of Joshua. God can and will allow the actions of disobedience to linger in our lives as a form of testing. To go back to Zechariah, to go back to what we just talked about a couple weeks ago, we aren't entitled to be angry at God when that happens. If we are going to God and we're angry, it's because we have pride that needs to be crushed. We never get to go before God and be angry at what he's doing in our life, whether it's bad or good. Because we don't go, we don't have a bad attitude when God does good things in our life. Why would, we, why would we have any entitlement to go and be mad at him when bad things happen? That's the whole message of Job. We get to be indifferent when God works in our life because it's for his glory, even if it's through pain, and especially if it's because it's our own fault. Okay, so while we're looking at the judges, while we're looking at the Israelites, oh man, these guys looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. should have just listened. And examine your walk. Examine where you are in your relationship with God. There may be things that God has not gotten rid of in your life because it's, a, it's there for a purpose and it's to test you and it's a result of disobedience or it's a result of sin that you made previously in your life. And he can get rid of it, but he can also leave it. But we need to check our attitude. We need to make sure that we're approaching God with, with the proper uh, headspace, I guess you could say. Always keep yourself in check. Don't go to God with anger. Don't go to God with entitlement because what you're doing is you're showing God that you still struggle with pride. So that needs to be addressed first. Okay. Now, really quickly, because I am watching the time, we're at 841. So I'm going to try to get done on time here, see if we can breeze through chapter three. I doubt it, but we'll try. The context of chapter two. So the context for this, this book or this chapter that we're looking at in Judges, we see some generational comparisons and we see the spiritual shortcomings given to us as context for the failures of the Israelites during this time and leading into the time of the judges. Okay. For the character of God for this chapter, God's grace has limits. Okay. That's something we should remember. God knows how much mercy we need. God's, God knows how much grace we need to have. And he also knows when we've made a decision in our heart that we're not going to accept either. And at that point, he's going to facilitate that decision and give us over to hopefully trials and tribulations that will lead to repentance. But we can't expect to be able to run to him when we're blatantly disobedient and we're blatantly living in sin and we're blatantly committing adultery with idolatry in our life and turn back to him after 50 different times of abusing that forgiveness and that mercy and that grace and expect him to just be there. Because just like we see through here, he's, he's, got a, he's got a period. And when we get to the end of Judges, we'll see this. He's got a period of time where he's going to say, okay, cool, you've made that decision in your heart. I'm going to facilitate that. If you repent, Great, I'm still here. And we'll be we'll be just as things were before. But until that happens, you're working against me, and so you're going to get the same in return. Now, the con the context for me to take away on this is to take warnings seriously. If I find myself having warnings given to me by God, I absolutely need to make sure that I am taking those 100% seriously and not just being flippant or taking a prideful attitude towards that. Okay? So before we start, or at least attempt to do Chapter 3, any questions? Or any comments on chapter two? Okay, can't say I didn't give you the chance. Oh, somebody have something? Ever? Were you gonna say something? Yeah, the, I was <laughs> just gonna say it because I find it I find it interesting that how like the they keep kind of going in this same rotation, right? As far as like they cry out to God, God sends them a, a judge. And, you know, and then he dies and then it's like the same, that kind of can drive you crazy, but it's kind of like similar what we're going through right now. I feel like it's almost the same. No, 100% is the last couple of generations. Um, it's the same thing. You've got kind of a remnant who's on fire for God who, you know, we'll see work and we're seeing less of it in America, but it's still happening across the world. You know, for those of you who have maybe friends or anything that are in ministries that are outside of America, God's totally active. He's performing miracles. The gifts of the Spirit are completely active. He's doing those things still, but it's becoming fewer and further between because people are compromising and they're going back into their old ways and they're leading themselves into sin. And then you have churches that are just full of sin that have been like that for generations since they initially were started by someone who was on fire for God, right? And it, it survives, but you know God's not in it and he's not working through it. And so that's you know, that's why I made that comment when we started the book is we're living in a judge's generation and we had before us 
you know, a Joshua generation who saw God working and moving. We see these big ministries with these big names, and they were actually effective for God and fighting for the truth and out sharing the gospel, but they didn't, they didn't develop discipleship or leadership as part of their ministry. And so it falls off. And then once they die, we're left with the generations we have now, which is the judges' generations. They're compromising. They're taking on the world standards. So Cheryl, did you have a comment? Yes, uh, it was kind of a comment and a question. Um, would this be a good uh, example of casting your pearls before swine because um, God kept like getting them out of trouble and then they kept going straight back into it? Like, is that kind of a good example of what Jesus said or no? I would say no, because these, even though they're struggling and they're, you know, they're, they're being disobedient, we see God showing them pity. They're still considered his people, right? Because of the promise that we see at the beginning where he said, I made the promise to your fathers. I'm still going to be faithful to my end of the covenant. And he was, he was showing them grace and continually giving, basically showing them patience, right? That he was still going to be there and still be merciful. I, I wouldn't say that that, I, I wouldn't compare the two, so to speak, because I don't think that this is, you know, God casting anything before swine because they're still his people. Right. Does that make you sense? Give me a, yes, it does. I was just wondering because I've I, I've been struggling to understand that verse. Could you give me a good example of what casting your pearls before swine would actually be? Yeah. So I, in the context of what we're looking at here, we're you know casting the pearls before swine, w- which is being talked about in the New Testament, was in in uh, context of the Pharisees of the time. Um, you know, casting your pearls before the people who have rejected God is like wasting your time from someone who's already made their decision, right? You're casting your efforts and your, you know, the God-given talents and resources on someone who's rejected God. That's basically wasting your time and casting your pearls before swine, right? So modern terms, you know, we don't necessarily get to decide who that case is because because I think that's kind of the, the the line that a lot of people like to cross. Well, oh, I decided that these people are swine because they're pretending like they know the truth or they're not willing to listen to my testimony. So I'm not even going to share, um, you know, the gospel or my testimony with them, right? And they use that. They say, well, I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. That's not to say that there aren't people who have rejected God and who are completely living in, in opposition to him. And we can see and understand that if we have biblical discernment, but I would define the, the swine in that context. Modern times would be the Pharisees. Modern day, or I guess I said ancient times would be the Pharisees. Modern day would be the religious leaders who are false teachers and false prophets. Okay. That's the way that I see that, the way that the context is kind of painted in, in scripture. It's um, not the degenerates from the world standards, but the people who have rejected God. And that really boils down to the false teachers, the ones who are speaking on behalf of God that don't know God, right? That would be the swine that you're not casting your pearls before. I have a friend. She says she believes in Jesus, but she also studies the Quran and she has family members that are Muslims and she Mm -hmm. honors them. And then she goes off on Saturdays and does yoga. And then on Sundays, it's about Jesus. And then on Mondays, it's about Muhammad. So it's like, Every time I keep trying to tell her that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come unto the Father but by him, um, she she's like the Oprah. She seems to think that there's many roads to God, and no matter how much I seem to show her that there's only one road that leads to Jesus, I just feel like I'm beating my fist against the air, you know? Sure, but that's— so. I would say that that's more of a situation where we see in the New Testament where you share your truth, you share the gospel, and if they reject it, then you dust your cloak off and you move on, right? I think kind of the pearls before swine is you're preventing yourself from even sharing or putting effort towards something versus, you know, give them the truth anyway, and if they accept it, that's not on you. So brush your shoulders off and move on to the next project that God has for you, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we should absolutely do that because, you know, the seed that you plant now— um, when things hit the fan, when when biblical prophecy starts to come fulfill, you know, starts to be fulfilled, and the entire world can see it because it's on the world stage, you know, people will remember that you shared the truth about who Jesus was, and that'll be an opportunity for them to come to you to find out what's happening next, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I always always encourage share the truth. Don't get caught up on whether or not the person's going to actually accept the truth, right, or if they're going to actually follow after the truth of the Bible, because we live in it. We and it's kind of a blessing, and this may be apathetic on my part, but share the truth. And when, when the time comes, if they're still alive, they'll come back to you to find more answers because you'll be the one that, you you know, shed the initial light on the truth to begin with. Uh, Go ahead, Lauren. 
Okay. What I wanted to say is, um, you know, God disciplines those he loves and it's such a blessing for the discipline of God that when we act in disobedience, even after his discipline, it's almost a rejection of his love. I think if we need to be careful though, because we can get down on ourselves if we take a bad attitude on our, uh, on our actions or our failures. Right. Right. There's a certain, there's a certain line. We need to take our failure seriously. We need those do need to impact us. We need to make sure we're not searing our conscience, but at the same time, when we do fail, we need to make sure that we can pick ourselves up and move forward when God does give us correction. Right. right? And that's not to say that that's not a good attitude to have because we are right. We're, we're hurting a relationship. We're taking advantage of something God's done. And we're, I, I consider it abusing grace. Yes. Right. By absolutely. doing that, you, you know better. God's corrected you, and yet you're still doing it. And that's an abuse of God's grace because, kind of in the back of your mind, you know He's going to forgive you. You know it's going to be okay. And so that abuse of grace is something that should concern us. But I see a lot of Christians, and, and I'm not saying that you do this, Lauren, but I've seen a lot of Christians who get into the woe is me. I'm such a failure. And it just becomes a pity party. Right. Right. A pity party is just a different version of, of pride. Would it be the same right. as taking His grace in vain? Yeah, right. It would be something okay. like that where we would take it seriously and we would we, it would grieve our our spirit. It would grieve our hearts because right. we know we should be doing better and that should drive us so that next time we remember that pain and we remember the heartache that we went through so we don't do it again. Right? We can use that mm-hmm. as motivation, but eventually when we are broken from that bondage and we aren't struggling with that anymore, you know, we talked about this in Zechariah, those past failures become glory that we can give to God. Yes. Right, as part of our testimony. So yes, take it seriously. But just don't beat yourself up about it, right? Jesus said he didn't bring condemnation, right? right? Conviction should be just for a moment, and that pain should sting us so we remember next time not to do it, okay? okay? But we should definitely be quick to let it go because God's not holding grudges. He's not holding it over our head. He's not expecting us to, you know, be guilty of it and, and have this condemnation moving forward. He expects it to sting, and we should use that, and we should remember that pain and so that moving forward we can avoid further pain by, you know, abusing grace, so to speak. Now, Justin. I do see your comment. The last sentence, the last sentence of chapter two, does it imply God knew the future and kept Joshua from conquering? <laughs> Excuse me. It says, and Jehovah left those nations without dispossessing them quickly, and he did not deliver them into the hand of Joshua. I believe so. Part of it was Joshua. If you read through Joshua, part of his attitude was he started to get sick of the victory. And so he didn't fulfill and push through to the goal that God had set before him. So part of it was on Joshua, but God saw what was going to be taking place. And so he left them there. And he knew what was going to happen in the generations following him, and he used it for his glory. We're not going to do it today. We're going to just wrap this up. But in chapter 3, actually, let's do this. Let's just read the first part of chapter 3, because that'll contextualize that verse that you're talking about, Justin. Let's go one verses 1 through verses 6, and we'll wrap it up. So in verse 1, he says, And these are the nations which Jehovah left in order to test Israel by them, all who did not know all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the sons of Israel might know to teach them war, Only those who did not know before them. So what he's saying is he left those nations in order to test Israel by them and all of those who didn't know what the wars of of the Canaanites looked like. So in verse 2 he says that only those generations the sons of Israel might know to teach them war. Right? So he foresaw what was going to happen and he utilized that as part of his plan to say, well, Joshua was not going to fulfill it. That's fine. I'm not going to deliver everybody into his hand because he's being disobedient. And as a result of it, the coming generations are also going to struggle, but it's going to test them and it's going to provide them an understanding of what the wars with Canaan are like. Because remember, God promised that he was going to wipe the land clean through the through the work of Joshua. There weren't supposed to be any Canaanites and it was just going to be Israelite victory all the way until they settled the land. But because Joshua didn't follow it through, now you've got a generation following them who had never tasted and understood what war with Canaanites were like. Right? They didn't understand what that looked like because they were on the tail end of what was supposed to be a blessing. So God says, I'm going to leave these nations. I'm going to test Israel. And in doing that, they're going to learn what it's like to have to war with their enemies in the land they were supposed to inherit. Okay, So that goes back to God will and can allow the disobedience of your actions to, to be a test and to be kind of a pin in the side moving forward so that he can teach you and test you to see if you're paying attention. Okay, Does, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go ahead and read three, four, five, and six here. He says, Five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonites, or in the Sidon, 
Sidonians and the Hivites uh, that lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to the entering of Hamath. That, so Baal Hermon to the entering of Hamath, that's like the northernmost portion of Israel up into the land of ancient Syria, to give you a little bit of context on that. And they exited to test Israel by them to know whether they would listen to the commands of Jehovah, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now pay attention to verse 6. And they took their daughters to themselves for wives and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Why was intermarriage a problem? Was it just because he didn't like the people? Go ahead, Eber. No, because uh, they would bring their own gods and their own idolatries into into the marriage. That's exactly that's exactly what happened time after time. Happen, that's what happened with, with Solomon. Right? One of the first things that he did was establish, he, he established a relationship with Egypt, took uh, one of the daughters of the Egyptian ruler and built a temple for her alongside building the temple for Jehovah. Uh, Leslie, were you going to say something? No, he he got <laughs> sorry, I'm coughing. No, he had it. Yeah, and, and, well, and furthermore, it wasn't just uh, like a good. It wasn't um, uh, it wasn't one of those things where it's a guideline. You know, this is just general good advice. We see in Exodus that this is something God specifically told them not to do as a people, right? And I actually, the reference I have here, it's mentioned in more than one spot, but the reference we're going to look at is Exodus 34, 12 through sixteen, and this is in context of the covenant he says in verse 12 take heed to yourself that you not cut a covenant with the people of the land which you are going in that it is not to be a snare in your midst but you shall cut down their altars break their pillars and you shall cut off their asherahs for you shall not bow bow to another god for jehovah whose name is jealous he is a jealous god that you not cut a covenant with the people of the land and they fornicate with their gods and they call to you and you eat from his sacrifice and you take from their daughters for your sons, and their daughters fornicate with their gods, and they lead your sons to fornicate with their gods, you shall not make for yourself casted gods. Yeah, Esau, yes, Samson, good examples, Solomon. Right, so he says specifically in the terms of the covenant, which their fathers had accepted, by the way, that you don't do these things, and what do we see specified in Judges Chapter 3, right at the very beginning, in all of the sons of Israel, they took their daughters for themselves for wives and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Okay, so he used them to teach the Israelites war and had not experienced it. The test was to know whether they would listen to the commands of Jehovah. We see that in verse 4. And in verse 6, we see they failed. Okay, now, uh, we'll stop there. We'll wrap it up. Uh, next week, I want you guys to study verse uh, Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through the end of the chapter. And then I want you to study chapter 4 and 5. And we're going to go through all of those next week. The first one is Othniel. Short example. Next one's going to be Ehud. Uh, always one of my... I always thought it was a really funny story. Uh, just kind of my sense of humor. But the deliverance of, of his message to Elgon is something that I always thought was really funny. Just the way that it's described. Uh, we'll read that next week, but we'll go through that. This is going to be the first examples of the cycles of sin. So we're going to kind of uh, compare those and look at those a little bit. Um, so study that. So study the rest of chapter three, study four and five. We'll go through those. We'll look at the cycles of sin. We'll look at the context of um, what's going on in four and five when we're looking at Deborah and Barak. For those of you who are women on the study, Deborah uh, and Hulda are, are two examples that you should have down pat. You should know and understand what God did through them so that when you hear all of these false Christians today saying, oh, well, God doesn't want women in leadership, you can say, well, biblically, you're wrong, and here's why. So we're going to look at them, um, and we're going to uh, hopefully pull some more truth out. But we'll wrap it up here. We'll cut it off because time's out. Uh, before we do, uh, any questions uh, or any comments? Before we wrap God it up. shows us like, oh, I just had one comment. Yeah, go about, ahead. Um, how God shows us, you know, like human nature, right? It's easy for us to like cry out to him when things are going bad or not going our way, you know, and then he comes through. But then the cycle of sin still continues. And, and we just we always we're so needy of him. You know, it feels like we can't do anything without him. But <laughs> when when we can. Yes. When we come to that realization 
God can do so much more progress in such a short amount of time than if we're busily busy, just kind of like keeping our head down and, and, you know, we have that tunnel vision, but that's the point. That's the, you've ever just shared that point that is, is, is kind of the bottom of the barrel. We need God for everything. We need him for support. We need him for power to overcome. We need him to identify things that are a problem. And we need him to help us turn things over to him so that they can be overcome. We literally can't do anything without his spirit in our life when it comes to the spiritual standard he set in scripture. And when we come to realize that, we can go and say, well, that's easy for me because all I have to do is be obedient. That's literally all I have to do. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to make the game plan. I don't have to try to figure out where my resources are coming from. I don't have to do anything. I just need to listen to God. I need to have good habits and let him counsel me. I need to spend time in prayer, and I have to seek his truth more than anything else in my life. And if I do those things, it's just going to get easier and easier. Now, I say easier. It'll be easier and quicker to mature. That doesn't mean it won't be painful. That doesn't mean that it's not going to be you know, quick in some areas. It may take longer in others. But that's the crux of a mature walk with Christ. We need him for everything. And, and that's not just, just, I'm not just like exaggerating there. We're, we're just trying to make like a point. It's we literally need God for every aspect of success in our, in our walk with him. And when we admit that and when we can go to the Lord with that meek and humble attitude, that's when we'll see the greatest maturity. That's when we'll see the greatest progress. Now, that's why I always say it doesn't matter how long you're a Christian. You can be a Christian for six months. And if that's your mentality and you're on fire, you can become more spiritually mature than someone that's been in church for 50 years who is still an infant and doesn't and is still dealing with that cycle of sin. Okay, so don't ever get discouraged that you're young in your walk or that you haven't been in church long enough or that you don't have a degree or that you don't have an MDiv or a theology degree, right? None of that matters. All that matters is you're going through the Holy Spirit University and you're doing it with meekness and humility and God's going to be able to do great things in your life. Okay? So that's the takeaway. Leslie, were you going to say something? Oh yeah, mine is a little sideways, but it left an impact, I guess. Uh, so I watched this movie with my sister the other day. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's called Greenland. It's got Gerard Butler in it. And mm -hmm. summary really quick of it, if, if you don't know what it's about. So basically a comet's coming down to Earth. So um, the government starts preparing people and starts selecting families by their jobs. So if you're a teacher, a doctor, an engineer, something of importance, you got selected, whereas everybody got like left behind and you had to mm -hmm. get on the planes at the army bases or whatever and get over to Greenland because that's where the shelters were. So I was just looking at it and it was just it's um, I was just really sad by it because you see the people don't know what's going on. Full panic. They're going in the stores, looting and shooting people. Um, the wife in the movie, her son, like, gets taken from her because they want, because the son has one of the wristbands to get in because his dad was an engineer, so he's going to get in uh, mm -hmm. with the dad, but they turned him away because he had medical issues. But I guess what stuck with me was just how dark it gets, and when this happens, like, how crazy people go and lose their minds, and how they, I mean, one person was trying to get the wristband from the husband, so they ended up fighting, the then the husband defending himself killed the guy, and I just saw this, and I said, you know, in the tribulation, like, this stuff is going to happen, and only us Christians, I mean, yeah, we might be a little fearful because we're seeing these things, but at the end of the day, we have, like, God to depend on, and I don't need to go through some kind of selection or lottery or whatever to hope to get chosen because my family, mother, dad, husband, whatever it would be, it would have a good enough job. You know, I have God to protect mm -hmm. me and, like, move me out of the way. So I was just watching that, and it was really sad. Like, I told her, I'd be like, I don't want to finish watching it. But she's like, well, we already paid for it, you know, like, on Amazon Prime. <laughs> so I'm like, it was cheap. It was, like, five ninety nine or something. So I was yeah. like, okay, we'll finish it. You get, like, a two-day rental. So I finished it. But she's like, well, it's better to see it be, like, prepared and, like, see how, you know, people are acting and all that. But that just really, I guess, it hurt my heart because I just, I saw that. And then, you know, they drove off with the little boy in the car and the mom. She's running down screaming. And, you know, I was like, I told Audrey, I blamed the mom because she should have told him, don't talk about the wristband in the car, you know. But he was like, yeah, my dad, he's got a wristband. We got him. And they're like, all oh, those wristbands on the news that, you know, we need to get to, you know, to Greenland and all that. So it was crazy. But it, it's a decent movie if anybody wants to watch it. But it just... It impacted me and it showed me what to expect and how I don't need to worry and I don't, you know, need to fret about that. Okay, I'm sorry I went off track, but that's my my stuff. No, that's good. That is that is good. That's a point to be well taken. When you when you mature, that trust grows and you don't, you know, you're not concerned with the same thing and the same standards that the world's concerned with. You know, because they're looking at it through their lens of understanding, but we look at it through the lens of scripture, and that's why we can have that peace and that assurance. So we can know that we're okay. Uh cool. Um, 
yeah, everybody keep uh, Andrea's dad in prayer. Um, uh, obviously, struggling with some stuff. And we saw Lauren's request um, for her friend and that and that family. What's going on? So uh, make sure we keep everybody in prayer as we kind of go throughout our weeks. But um, aside from that, I will close in prayer in just a second. Any other comments or concerns from anybody before we do wrap things up? I have a praise report. My brother-in-law is doing much better. He does That's have um, pneumonia in both of his lungs, but he is getting better by the day. He's on the uptrend. That is good to hear. Yes. That's very good to hear. That's why we need to be consistent in our prayers and always have faith that uh, God's hand is in everything because it is, right? We just need to pray for his will and, um, you know, he'll glorify himself and we need to be that vehicle and, and help to be a catalyst in those circumstances with people who are still trying to find truth and still looking for, um, you know, that relationship. So. Cheryl, your hand is still up. Did you have another comment that you wanted to share? Are you okay? Okay. I'll I'm so good. sorry, y'all. I'm so sorry. I forgot to put it down. <laughs> no, you're okay. I was just checking. No, you're fine. I just don't want to ignore you. Um, all right, cool. Uh, so let's do this. I see Justin, you're typing something and then we'll we'll close. Or maybe you're not. Maybe you are. I don't know. Okay, cool. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you for the wisdom that you're pouring out into this group. Lord, we ask that you would continue to do a work in our hearts. Lord, that you would use your Holy Spirit to help identify areas where we're, maybe we're disobedient or maybe we're lacking or maybe we're struggling, Lord, to be faithful on our end. Lord, don't. Don't let us stumble and fall like the examples that we see in Scripture where we're willing to compromise because we have a small faith or because we try to change the goal because it's too hard the way that you've told us to do it or because we can't see the resources or we don't know how you're working. But, Lord, strengthen those areas. Build up a firm foundation, Lord, that is complete and whole on your son, Jesus, so that we don't have to worry about whether or not we can actually follow you when you call us to be obedient. Lord, we know that you can do that through a process, and we ask that we would get out of the way and that you would help us to get out of the way. You would help us to die to pride, that you would help us to die to ego, that you would help us to die to fleshly impulses, Lord, to the lust of the flesh that we struggle with, that we could put those things aside, Lord, that our, our pride could die, that we can become an, a meek and a humble image of your son, someone who's a servant, Lord, someone who's generous, Someone who's a good steward of the blessings that you've given to us, not just the material blessings, Lord, but the gospel that you've delivered and the understanding that you've delivered and the testimony that you've developed in each one of our lives. Give us the utterance, Lord, and the boldness through the presence of your Holy Spirit to be able to speak out for truth, to defend your word. Lord, wherever it is that we're lacking, we ask that you would glorify yourself. Wherever it is that we're weak, you would step in and you would glorify yourself. Just like you told Paul, in our weaknesses, you are made strong. Help us to not be control freaks over the things that you're wanting us to do. But Lord, set a vision before each one of us of a ministry. Set before us, Lord, the goals and the, the things that you want us to achieve for your glory and for your plan and for your will. We're not asking you to give us every single detail, but we're asking that you would show us where we need to place our feet. And Lord, give us the strength to step there when you do. Lord, the time is running. The time is running out. We know it. We can see it. Lord, there are things that are happening behind the scenes that we can't see, and we know that you're facilitating the end of your plan. Prepare us and provide us with the wisdom, Lord, that we can be a beacon of truth. We can be a beacon of light to point people to you as things get darker and darker. We thank you for your provision, Lord. We thank you for your hand of protection in our lives. We thank you for good health. Lord, we thank you for working and providing and taking care of the things that we can see and the things that we can't see. You deserve the credit for everything good in our lives, Lord. Be with us this week. Keep your hand of protection in our lives and test us. Lord, push us out onto faith. Test our faith to make sure that we know it's genuine. Give us opportunities to share this week. Give us opportunities to be generous this week. Help us to find Lord, people who are hungry, people who are, Lord, that need you, that are looking for your truth, help us to step out into obedience, to shed that light into their lives and to change the lives of other people to find you. Because we know in doing that and being obedient, our faith can only grow. Help us to not waste time this week, Lord, 
as we go about our day to days, help us to identify time that we can spend in prayer and time that we can spend being counseled by you, listening for you, spending time in your word and seeking your wisdom. And Lord, kindle a fire so that when we don't and when we are wasting time and we're being lazy and apathetic, Lord, that we would be quickened. Lord, that you would convict us to be productive for you. Not because you're a taskmaster, not because you're a slave driver, but because it will benefit our walk and our relationship with you if we take those things seriously. Thank you for the work you're doing in this group, Lord. Thank you for this Bible study. Thank you for the freedom to be able to sit down and discuss your word freely without the fear of persecution. You deserve the glory and the honor for everything in our lives. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Everybody have a good week, and I'll uh, speak to you guys next Monday. Let me know if you guys need anything. Amen. Cool. All right. Thanks, Brandon. Thank See you, guys. Brandon. God bless you. Good night. Good night.